My name is J.C. McCauley and you're watching AccessTV.org. to this amazing symposium, Sailing on Broken Pieces, uh, Central Survival Skills Symposium on Mental Illness in the African American and Minority Community. This is an event for Black History Month, and while we celebrate uh, African American first or things that have happened over uh, a long period of time and centuries in, of our history to celebrate, this is also a time to look at issues of significance and importance in our community and how we're going to deal with it with, with solutions to the problems. My name is Yvonne Davis and I'm the president and CEO of Davis Communications. I am the event manager and public affairs specialist for Dr. Gary Rule. And it is my honor and pleasure to be here to be a part of integrated part of such an important discussion that we believe will continue throughout the state expand in the niche uh, region and then go and partner um, along the nation. I'd like to bring to you to the podium a woman that everyone in this room has been able to experience in such a positive way in terms of energy, power, and strength. Beyond the fact that she has been the president and chief executive officer for the Conference of Churches since 2001, she has certainly developed a national and international reputation in expanding the faith-based dialogue amongst ecumenical groups and beliefs to be able to bring people together to an awareness of understanding that allows people to be able to build consensus that we have more peace and understanding. This woman knows her power, walks with power, and is not bragging about her power. It's just there with a compassionate heart, and you can see this room around you, this room feels is full of love and compassion. And I'm sure she's going to explain to you the artwork that comes up here. I've known her, Dr. Dr. Reverend Shelley Best for a long time. And it's my honor and privilege to bring forth to you the woman to set the tone for this, this morning, Reverend Dr. Shelley Best. Good morning. I'd like to first welcome you to the 224 Eco Space, a place where people work, create, and lead. Over the course of the last five years, the Conference of Churches has been in the midst of developing this 30,000 square foot facility. Our goal with this place was to show that faith-based community development could actually create a place that's a learning laboratory. So here at the 224, you can experience this, the Collaboration Center, a place where all kinds of people come together as thought leaders to make a difference in our community, our region, and our world. We also have the Living Well Center, where that's how we address health equity, and we provide services like yoga, massage therapy, health coaching, and a lot the like. And we also have here in the facility, we're in the midst of developing our co-working space where entrepreneurs will be able to work together and build their businesses. Today, I'm glad to host you. This is a curated event and Yvonne is one of the thought leaders that we look to when it comes to activities happening here at the 224. I'm delighted to have you because this issue is something that is really a part of my formation as a human being. Oftentimes people meet you as the person that you are today, but nobody knows where you came from. There is an old spiritual that many of us know. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. You look at me and you think this sister has it all together, but I was talking earlier and 
I wonder what the phrase is, but the only thing I could describe it as is, I am a survivor of mental illness. I am a child of a mother who was bipolar. And in the time period of the 50s and 60s, African-Americans were not necessarily treated that well in the mental health system. My mother was bipolar and spent a lot of time in the mental health institutions of Connecticut. After every child, she would go away to Newtown and be locked down for a little while while she experienced electric shock therapy and would come back home, not the woman that she left. That was my mother. You know, a lot of us have the experience where we're at home and there's a relative that lays on the couch all the time. That's what it was for my mother. So I'm a survivor of the experience of a mother who was alive but not present. Likewise, growing up in a home with a mother who struggled so much with her mental health, my older sister also had that experience, my sister Sandy. I tell the story in my book that's getting ready to come out about my sister saying to me one morning as a child, because she was 12 years older than me, Shelly, I'm going to go up in the woods with our bulldog and an Afghan and I'll be back. And I said, okay. And then my mother woke up later and she said, where's Sandy? Because she knew that Sandy was acting a little funny. And I said, mommy, Sandy says she's going up in the woods with our bulldog and an Afghan. And my mother said, we don't have a bulldog. My sister had taken my father's shotgun and gone up in the woods and was missing for most of the day. As a child of about six years old, I was excited because a helicopter landed on our front lawn and my father jumped out because he was away at National Guard drill and they went and got him so he could be there as the state police and the bloodhounds looked for my sister. Later that day, they found my sister up in the woods and she had lost the rifle and they brought her home and then brought her to the same mental hospitals my mother had been in. At that point, my older sister Sandy suffered with bipolar disorder for many years. You know, there's something about having a family member with mental illness because it is a roller coaster ride that only people on that journey can fully understand. I loved my sister, but it was a roller coaster ride, and you learn how to pay attention to the signals because Sandy's mannerisms would change. She would become a little bit more dramatic in her affect and her dress. And I always knew that I had to be ready for whatever was going to come. Those midnight calls, Shelly, come and get me. They're out to get me. Or calls that Sandy had been arrested because at that time, just like now, very often you can't get into the mental health system unless you're arrested. That's how it is for people of color. We have to be arrested to get mental health treatment. And so my sister spent many years in and out of the mental hospital. And since we're here and I consider it a place with family and friends, my sister had a season of life where she couldn't really maintain a traditional job. So she worked back in the day as a street walker right here in this neighborhood of Asylum Hill back in the 70s. And I say that because as a child, I looked at my sister Sandy with wonder because that was the time when street walkers used to dress. I'm talking about the 70s. She'd have some glitter, she'd have some fringe, she'd have wild makeup, and Sandy would walk the street and make her money and struggle with her mental illness. What I didn't realize growing up was that it ran in the family. And nobody really explained to me that that's what was going on. I can remember that my great grandmother used to lay on the couch and my mother and grandmother would take care of her. And she laid on that couch until she died. But nobody described it as mental illness. It was just part of the family. She never left the house. Later in life, at the age of 26, Two weeks after I got accepted to work for the Department of Children and Families, I was getting ready to start the job a week later, I got word that my younger sister Sharon, who was a sophomore at Harvard University on full scholarship, she had graduated valedictorian from Choate Rosemary Hall, I got the call that nobody wants to get. Shelly, you've got to come home. Why? Sharon's commit suicide. 
And what's tragic is we had struggled with Sharon and her mental illness for many years. She had been in treatment and she too was struggling with depression. And what was so hard was that Sharon also was struggling with her sexual identity, but this was the 80s. And we didn't accept at that time as a culture, gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgendered young people. And so Sharon was struggling with being a lesbian and trying to stay in the closet. So she felt it was better to deal with her mental illness and deal with her sexual identity issues by committing suicide. And she had threatened this so many times that people didn't take her seriously. And so her body wasn't found for about four days. And the funeral director told me that they couldn't have the open casket because her body had deteriorated. And so today we are gathered together as a community out in the daylight, out in the public to eliminate the silence, to eliminate the shame, to stand together as one, to tell the story and to improve the system of care for people struggling with mental health issues. Especially when it comes to people of color, we should not stay in the shadows anymore. Many of you can remember that movie, Soul Food. There was that old man that stayed in the back room and he was the uncle that just stayed in the back room. And if many of us think of our family history, especially as people of color, we remember the self-medicating uncle who was always drunk at family affairs or that relative that laid on the couch or the person that was in the back room or that relative that might have been sexually promiscuous or that person who would rapidly go off at family events and they had temper issues. And now as grown folks, we can say it's mental illness. And as a society, we've got to do better. And we can no longer stand aside and let people just lie on the couch without help. So today it is indeed an honor for me to stand here to welcome you to this sacred space surrounded by quilts from the private collection of Eugenetta Miller, a fiber artist. Many of these quilts are family quilts, many of them from the 1800s representing people just out of slavery telling their story through the quilts. So that's an indicator of what it is to be surrounded by the love of family. And so today we are here with Dr. Gary Rule, a person who embodies what it is to be engaged in a love of family. He made the tough decision to shift his life to care for family because he thought that was the most important thing. And out of his journey, he has created a wonderful work that is available to many of you today. And he's opened the door for a conversation that we've waited too long to have. So without further ado, I present to you, Dr. Gary Rule. Good morning and thank you, Reverend Dr. Shelley Best for that introduction. Um, first and foremost, thank you everyone for being here. And one of the things I think that's so important is we are embarking on a topic that is completely taboo. Taboo because no one wants to talk about it. I worked in emergency medicine for 20 years. And what I saw was many people who came into the emergency department who had a mental health condition, sometimes known, sometimes not known. Part of the reason why I decided to speak up is like Dr. Best, in my own family, there are four to five persons who have schizophrenia. No one wants to talk about it. In 2012, when I said to my family, really my mom and my brother, I think it's so important for us to share this story. What they said was, no, you can't tell anyone because people will know that we're different. And so I boldly say to you today, they've accepted the fact that we'll talk about it, but it took some time to get to that place. So did you know that only one in five Americans have optimal mental health. One in five. So if you look around the room and you count one, two, three, four, five, <laughs> only one, one in five, keep on counting, has, <laughs> has, has optimal mental health. 
mental health meaning that sense of mental well-being where you're optimally able to deal with the changes in life, cope with all of life's stressors, and really do very well. Only one in five. Yet, no one wants to have a discussion about mental health and the connection to everything else that we do. Mental illness is a diagnosis, right? So a diagnosis meaning that either your thoughts, your emotions, your personality, your behaviors interferes with the way that you function in terms of your relationships, your ability to go to school, to work, to enjoy recreation, to be a participant in everything in your life, your political life, your community life, whatever you like to do. That's mental illness, that's a diagnosis. One in four persons actually has a mental health condition that's diagnosable as a mental illness. So if you count again, one in four of us has a diagnosis. And in our lifetime, one in two of us will have a um, diagnosis that qualifies us for mental illness. So it's you and it's I. There are over 25 million persons in recovery from substance abuse and alcohol. They are called the anonymous people because they're people who look just like you and I, who are our CEOs, our presidents. Yes, our presidents. Abraham Lincoln actually suffered from clinical depression a long time ago, but did really well. Our presidents, our janitors, our mothers, our fathers, our aunts, many, many people. It shouldn't be taboo because you can get better, people recover, and even though I talked about substance abuse to 20, the 25 million people, people get better. There's 61 million families living with a diagnosable, either taken care of or living with someone with a mental health condition. It's very, very common. One of the things that I actually find somewhat appalling is that we have so much information. We have so much information available, but a recent study from the Kaiser Foundation said despite the fact that we know that mental illness has a biological basis, despite us knowing that, and we're a very informed society, what has really happened in the last 100 years, our attitudes about people who have mental illness is actually worse than at the turn of the century, which to me is surprising. We have lots of information available. You can go online, you can Google, you can tweet. We have so much information, yet the attitudes about mental illness is kind of going in the reverse. I'm not going to spend all morning talking about my experience, but I want to just talk about three things which I hope with a very experienced panel will touch upon. The first reason I will tell you the why I do this is for, for one reason. When I was a kid and in my family, the way it worked was the older, the older brother took care of the rest of the three persons. So um, a family of four. My brother was the oldest, there are two sisters, I'm the youngest brother. And the way that my dad parented was, if the younger sibling, if myself or my brother or my two sisters did something wrong, they broke a glass, they, the, room, the room was disrupted, the way that actual discipline worked was the older brother got it. So he got beaten first, even if he had nothing to do with it. That's really kind of how it worked. And so from a very early age, he was responsible for all three of us. I grew up in Kingston, Jamaica and I went to school in a place called Crossroads. And um, he would go to school, and his responsibility was to pick me up after school. On one particular day, I was about six or seven years old. On one particular day, we were walking back towards Crossroads, and out of the blue, three guys jumped out, much older guys, came out, jumped out, and wanted to fight. For some reason, that was unknown to me. And I remember him very clearly pushing me behind him. He was only one, he was about 12. And he stood up to fight three guys much bigger than he was. And the sense of protection that he had for me as a young child, every single day when I think about what I do and why I do this, I think about that day. Because what I do is because of the love that we share, that common bond, and I do this because I believe that that should be expanded to many, many people to enable a conversation. Just think about the gift that your sibling and that person that connects you has done for you. That's why we do this. 
So that one story sticks in my mind. The other two things that stick in my mind is the following. I was about 10. And like many, many Caribbean people, the church and the religious organization is a focal part of our support system. I was 10 years old, I came home from school, and he was in the middle of what I call six praying ladies doing what's called a laying on of hands. And they were praying and they were screaming and they were touching his head and they were touching his body because from the family's perspective, there wasn't anything physically wrong with him. There was no physical disability. And mental illness and mental health is not a problem. So really, if you have an uh, issue with hearing voices, which he did, or if his behavior was so disconnected where he wasn't doing any self-care, he wasn't bathing, he wasn't brushing his teeth, um, he was wandering all over the place, he was failing in school, it's not physical. There really isn't a mental illness, so it must be spiritual. And so that the way that we cope, cope with that is it's a demonic possession, and really what you need is a laying on of hands to get rid of that issue. And unfortunately, it didn't work because there is a biological basis for mental illness. So that sticks in my mind. I hope that the panel will talk about the role of the church, the synagogue, the mosque, and the religious community in helping people access, engage in treatment, and actually get better, because I think that's really important, especially for the African-American community and persons of color. The other thing that sticks in my mind is, I'm not a psychiatrist, a colleague of mine told a story about a young man that she'd been seeing. He was 16 years old, and again, he was hearing voices, disconnected from family and friends, not bathing, self-care was a problem, failing in school, and he's 16 years old, so the family brought him in. There's a crisis. The police is obviously called, as they usually are. The police is called. He's taken in for care. He gets treatment. He gets hospitalized. He's out of care. That happens for two or three years. Then he becomes 18 years old. He's an adult. At that point, really, the parent really has minimum control over him. Every time he comes in, he says, I don't have a problem, that it's appearance. It's a system, it's everybody's problem except mine. What really happened is, again, like most people who deal with a mental illness problem, they seek solace. They try to find a place of, of, of care. And so he turns to alcohol and marijuana. He's 18 years old. Every time he comes in, alcohol, marijuana, he's hospitalized. The police brings him in, the family brings him in. On one occasion, though, he comes in by himself. It turns out that as a kid, he had a dog, a dog named Spot. And Spot was the only living being that he felt connected to. On this particular day, the psychiatrist, my friend, was in her office and she said she looked up and she saw him tapping at the window and he came in for care. And she was surprised because the police wasn't there, the family wasn't there, the friends weren't there. And she said to him, what happened? Why did you come this time? And he said, I was under the mango tree, I was drinking, and I was doing some ganja. And when Spot started to recite the 13th commandment to me, I recognized I had a problem and it was time to seek help. So it took, it took something like that, something that he felt connected to. When Spot then started to recite the dog, the 13th commandment, he recognized after four or five years of going back and forth that yes, there is a problem and I need to actually deal with it. So with that, those three things stick in my mind. I'm hoping therefore that the most experienced panel will share with us, how do we address the issue of stigma and discrimination? How do we engage persons into care what the entry into care might be, what are some of the barriers that prevent persons of color from being engaged, staying engaged, and getting to recover because recovery is possible. Very briefly, my brother is doing remarkably well. He's in therapy, he's on medications. I know people think that's also controversial. The truth is, if it weren't for medications, he wouldn't be alive today. He, he would be dead today. And so I know that people say, don't take meds for him, 
if it weren't for the medications and you take, I counted, he takes about 17 medications every day. But if it weren't for the medications, he would not be alive today. And so honestly, I'm very grateful for um, the spiritual component, the physical component, and the mental health component because it all works in concert. So I'm gonna now turn it over to the expert panel to come forward. Hopefully they'll talk a little bit about the role of the church, um, the role of community. How do you get um, African-American persons, persons of color, Asians involved in, um, involved in care? And again, it's a taboo conversation this is not meant for us to stand here to lecture to you. I looked around the room. There are many, many people with experience, more experience. Please share experiences with us. How do we engage a community? What do we need to do to strengthen the response to be sure that five or six years from now, or really 20 years from now, we're not having this conversation again? Or the conversation is a little bit different because it's probably going to still continue. But how do we strengthen our response to be sure that we've made a difference? So with that, any questions for me while I'm going to call a panel up? Okay, so we are very privileged to have with us today Deputy Commissioner Michael C. Williams from the Department of Children and Families. I'm not going to read his bio because his bio is in your booklet. And we're going to challenge him because we want to understand specifically about how do we intersect with children, adolescents um, in the healthcare system. Welcome, Reverend Williams. He's a reverend too, so I think he can answer from both perspectives, both as a spiritual leader, as well as from DCF, DCF perspective. Miss Kate Matthias from the National Alliance on Mental Illness a fabulous organization that I, that I work with who do fabulous work. Dr. Mercado Martinez, the Chief Clinical Officer from Heart for Behavioral Health. And Mr. Caleb Simmons from the Democratic Political, An he's a Democratic Political Analyst and a researcher and youth organizer. And what we, as said, are doing, because it's a taboo conversation discussion. We are not making it difficult for anyone in the panel. We want them to speak from their hearts passionately about who they are, what they do, why they do it, how do they engage the community, what are the opportunities to change the conversation, to strengthen our response to mental illness. Okay. Before I do that, if I can just do one thing. If you have a cell phone, Either place it on vibrate or airplane mode or turn it off, please. If you need to text or take a call, we understand that business still continues. If you could step outside and do that. And I think we're all set. And then other household items are restrooms are through the red doors and there are beverages, coffee, tea, water in the back. And I think a little bit of finger foods. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to the panel and we'll start with, we'll have some questions and what I'll actually do during the talk is if folks feel shy and they don't want to actually put their hand up and ask a question, I have cards with the pens, you can put your questions on there and we'll then share it with the audience. So with that said, Deputy Commissioner Michael C. Williams. You can, do you want to speak from your, from your panel or do you want to come up here? You, you can probably talk here because I don't have a, the mic is there. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, let me uh, first say that I am uh, grateful and honored to be uh, invited to such an important uh, topic in our community. Uh, just being invited alone uh, was enough. I didn't necessarily need to be a part of a panel because as I look out in the in the uh, audience here, there are so many of you who I know are doing frontline work uh, with folks who are experiencing uh, mental health uh, distress or 
a diagnosis of mental illness in their lives. So you can easily uh, change places with me and I can be there to listen to you. So I'm honored uh, to be there, uh, to be a part of this. Um, <clears throat> Considering the moment in time that we're in today, I think uh, this is a long overdue conversation uh, in our community. And let me just give you a bit of a, uh, a background of who I am. Uh, prior to working with the Department of Children and Families, where I've been there for 13 years now, uh, I ran a community mental health center uh, in the city of Hartford uh, for a little over 10 years. Uh, actually, Dr. Mercado is the clinical director of that organization uh, today, uh, Hartford Behavioral Health. Uh, and while being the uh, executive director of that organization, uh, I was bivocational. And for clergy, they know what that means, uh, you know, having two jobs. Um, and the second profession that I did while running a mental health center was pastoring uh, a couple of churches in Hartford. So you can imagine the experience I had coming from working with folks with mental illness uh, Monday through Friday uh, from eight to five and usually in the evenings and Sundays working with church folks. <laughs> Sometimes it was hard to determine <laughs> which environment I was in. And uh, I say that tongue in cheek, but I also say it seriously, uh, because there are so many things that are happening in, and it was particularly black church community, uh, that uh, uh, folks with mental illnesses needed help with that they did not provide. And so many things happening in provider communities in serving people who were struggling uh, with mental health needs that they should not have done. And so the dialogue that needed to occur uh, between the two communities uh, was something that uh, rarely happened uh, as though, uh, even though we tried our best to make it happen. Uh, there was fear on both sides, uh, fear from the faith community uh, to invite uh, the mental health community into uh, their space uh, because not just based on their belief that their faith was superior, but because of past experiences uh, that often resulted in abuse of people from a system that presented itself as a helping system. And so the faith community was reluctant to expose people to that system again. And then there was fear on the mental health and the mental health community of inviting the faith community into uh, their space uh, because of you know, the fear that if we allow uh, faith leaders and people who profess their faith to come in and see how we do our work and offer an alternative uh, to the treatments that we're offering our folks, uh, will they do more harm uh, to people by giving them uh, a false hope of what's actually going on with them and uh, condemn them uh, to uh, 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 you know, uh, that the medications that they're taking are evil or what's happening to them is a, you know, demonic and spiritual kind of uh, curse on them and cause uh, our patients to do worse uh, and not wanting to expose their patients uh, to what some would call uh, a religious abuse uh, was the fear on the mental health in the mental health community. And so trying to stand in the gap of both of those was extremely difficult. And I know many of you have done that and I've seen you do it on numerous occasions. I think today though, we have an opportunity uh, because believe it or not, we haven't come that far. Uh, today we have an opportunity 
uh, to really be authentic in this conversation uh, to say we can no longer afford for both groups to be in their camps because as long as the mental health community stays over here and the faith community stays over here and we never get together, there's a gap between us that people keep falling through. Uh, and we can easily bridge that gap and create an approach, create uh, 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 you know, opportunities for folks who are uh, experiencing mental health problems in their lives to get better not just to maintain, but to actually get better. And I hope this conversation this morning is gonna allow us to have that dialogue and have that uh, uh, opportunity uh, from all of us here to really uh, be authentic, be in a sense, be real in what we say about how to go about uh, uh, making a difference. So thank you. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Williams. So I have one question and I'll kind of set what we will end up doing is asking uh, each panelist to speak and then take maybe one or two questions from the audience and then have the rest of the folks go through their, their talk and then open it up really for discussion because that's what we want to do. We want to actually engage you in conversation. We don't want to sit here and talk at you. That's not why we're here. If we do that, we won't get anywhere. So I have one question. What, what, how would people who, how do they initially get engaged in DCF? How does the entry usually happen? Well, first and foremost, if there is a child who is believed to uh, be the subject of being abused either physically or any other way or being neglected, by uh, people in the community in which that child lives, uh, either other relatives, teachers, police officers, those who are mandated to report clergy. Uh, there is a responsibility and legal responsibility for some to report what they see and what they suspect uh, to the Department of Children and Families. Uh, that comes to our care line and that report based on what is being with the content of the report uh, we accept it uh, if it rises to the level of abuse and neglect or suspected abuse and neglect uh, once we accept the report then there that family is uh, subjected to uh, either uh, an investigation to determine if the child or children uh, whose subject who's the subject of the report is being abused or neglected or if the report has enough information to where we don't think it's abuse and neglect, but we think it's families who have significant need uh, to where we can make a difference, uh, we will accept it and that family then has an assessment rather than an investigation, kind of an assessment of need. So it can go down either of those, uh, either of those tracks. But at the heart of the report is children uh, who are either uh, being abused and neglected or being are at risk of being abused and neglected and i stop there uh, to offer the point as it connects to this uh, conversation this morning that uh, the trauma a child experiences a child would experience when they are in a situation uh, to where they're abused or neglected is significant we uh, for years did not understand that we did not know the impact of trauma on the brains and the development of children uh, today there's enough science there's enough technology there's enough literature there's enough anecdote for us to finally say we get it now that if you put a child in a situation where a child is abused physically sexually emotionally or neglected uh, to the point where that child uh, has to uh, wonder whether or not they're safe uh, due to the neglect, that child will experience a trauma that impacts the psychological development of that child that sometimes masks itself as serious mental illnesses such as the bipolar disorder, such as the schizophrenia, but it's trauma that's impacting the, the child's life and we miss that. 
and we end up treating the child in a way as if that child is oppositional defiant, as if that child has ADHD, as if that child has so many other things to where the child becomes the problem rather than the event the child went through being the problem and its impact on the life of that child. And so many children uh, have grown up with that misdiagnosis today into adults uh, who are uh, uh, struggling to get their mental health needs because no one stopped to really understand uh, the trauma uh, that children have experienced in their life, uh, that they had experienced in their lives when they were a child. And so uh, in our work, uh, we're, we're, we are approaching everything that we do now with a trauma lens to make sure we are, are detecting, we are assessing, uh, the trauma that uh, is impacting a child's life as a result of the things that they're experiencing. And when you really look in our communities today, particularly communities that are disenfranchised, that are marginalized, communities that are struggling with high levels of poverty, uh, children are seeing so much more than any of us have seen in our lifetimes back in the 50s, 60s, 70s when we grew up. And just think of what all children are exposed to you know, uh, in their lives, uh, 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 you know, in real time, and then exposed to in the media and the social media's uh, avenue, uh, 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 you know, vehicles that they are part of, from from music to movies to uh, uh, you know uh, uh, emails and all those kinds of things. You know, children are asked to be more resilient today than ever before. And unless there are strong adults, unless there are strong communities, unless there are strong folks in their lives to help them stay resilient, uh, you can imagine the structures of resiliency that are in lives of children starts to crumble. And it creates a significant vulnerability uh, for them uh, uh, to be abused uh, when abuse and neglect uh, happens to them. And so that's a long answer to the question of how does uh, family get involved with the Department of Children and Families. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. Do we have one or two questions for Deputy Commissioner? Uh, thank you. Wonderful, wonderful, Michael. Um, I don't have a question, just a, a comment maybe to think about or to respond to. Um, everything you've said, I know, is, is absolutely right on the target for the years of seeing this with many, many children. The other side of that is the difficulty in letting children know that the situation that they are in is not their fault. And so many of them grow up thinking, yes, I've you know, gone into treatment, I've got medicine, et cetera, but what did I do as a child that could have prevented this? So that's, that's, a, that's a really hard thing to say. Absolutely. And, and, and again, with all the technology that's out there and all the literature and and the information that's out there, we uh, have learned a lot uh, and we have evolved a lot. Uh, and in our learning and evolution, uh, one of the things we recognize is there are some things we did as a system to help people that actually did more harm. And, you know, the there there's this old... Uh, uh, a label that's often given to DCF uh, as baby snatchers or DCF comes to take children uh, that we've been trying to eliminate that kind of language or that kind of description of the work of child protection. You know, we don't take children. Uh, we remove children when they are not safe. And I think every adult who's here would uh, agree that if a child is in a situation where that child is not safe, the child should be removed. However, what we have come to know is that next to the death of a parent, the removal of a child from a parent, even if that child is being abused and neglected, is the second most traumatic and long lasting impact on the development of a child's life. And so we don't take it lightly to have to remove, even if abuse and neglect is occurring. And that's a hard, hard conversation uh, because you know children, when they are removed, uh, particularly from families that we have assessed or believe aren't able to meet their needs 
um, either emotionally or their basic needs or their safety needs, uh, those children have bonded to their parents and to their family structure. And it is a bond that's so uh, significant, and I would say sacred and spiritual in the context of our conversation, uh, that that when they are removed, you can imagine a child is trying to understand what did they do uh, to cause this. Maybe I should not have told that social worker what actually happened. You know, maybe I shouldn't tell my therapist what's really going on in the home. So you're absolutely right. I think our way in which we help uh, needs to constantly be analyzed to assure that our interventions are really helping and not hurting uh, children. Are there any programs that are collectively seeking out, particularly parents in these types of communities that we know are at risk, that you know persist, sort of um, preempt the case, the cause? <laughs> you, know, you, you spoke about parents that are struggling. They come from families that, and it's just a cycle that continues. Is there programs, I would go back to, within DCF, and I know that the system is overloaded with cases, but before the child gets into crisis, mm -hmm. so for example, reaching out outreach programs for, you know, um, high risk, just uh, communities. It's, it's an excellent question. It gives you an opportunity to, to say that you know, over the past year, uh, uh, the state legislature had uh, directed us to create uh, for the first time in Connecticut, a comprehensive and integrated behavioral health plan for all children of Connecticut. And uh, we embarked upon this process by having at least 200 listening sessions across the state, uh, inviting parents and uh, providers, youth, everyone to tell us uh, what works best uh, in a system and what should a system look like. And that plan was submitted uh, to the governor and the legislature uh, in October of last year. And if any of you want to see the plan, uh, we have a website that you can download it. It's uh, plan for kids, P L A N, the number four children.org, www.planforchildren.org. Uh, you can get it, you can, you can download it. It's extremely comprehensive and it addresses uh, the points you made that we know that. Um, Early detection and prevention and early intervention uh, uh, is the right thing to do. Uh, and the question about what programs there are, uh, instead of naming programs, I will name a, I will just describe a concept that I think all of us in this spirit of authenticity uh, need to uh, grapple with. And that is we have funded a tremendous amount of programs in Connecticut. Connecticut leads the nation probably in resources and you know the wealth of resources and funding for services and programs. The programs often tell us uh, a lot about how many people they served and they can you know in very fancy ways you know very you know, not, not, not to disparage programs, but, but they can talk about how well they served people. But the, the, the question that we get stuck on is the question of, is anyone better off from what you've done? And to answer that question, it's not for the programs to tell us that, it's for the people who are receiving their services to tell us that. And so when we talk to people who are receiving services from programs about are you better off as a result of this program coming into your life, you know, the results aren't that great. And so there are tons of services and programs. I think it's important for the community to be vocal about what works for you and what does not work for you. Uh, because there's a lot of investment in services uh, and some of those things just don't work, but they are continued to be invested because they can tell us how great they're doing it. An organized community around this issue is the best way to assure that the investments we're making in programs are the right investments and they're making a difference in the lives of families and children. So the programs 
that you're looking for, I would say, are the programs that you can absolutely, with evidence, say they, they work. Okay, thank you very much. We are going to ask Ms. Kate Matthias, Executive Director from NAMI, to come up. But before she does that, I just have one quick thing that I want to tell you that um, happened um, that I experienced plus read about. So I work in the ER, we see lots of trauma, and many people who suffer from mental illness, especially men, end up being homeless. So one day, this person comes in, um, homeless guy, and you know a couple of kids who, just being kids, end up putting a firecrack in his ear. He was sleeping on the street, so he comes in, his ear is all damaged. And you read this stuff all the time in the newspaper about how people attack folks who are homeless and or who are mentally ill for many, many reasons, because they don't understand what it is, or they're seen as less than people, less than human beings. So that thought just came to me. So we'll ask Ms. Matthias Kate to talk to us a little bit, uh, specifically to highlight NAMI, the programs that most of you, I'm sure, know about NAMI, programs that they do, how do they get funded, and we'll have her take the lead for you. Thanks. Good morning. Um, I was thrilled to be asked to come here today um, because one of the things, for those of you who don't know, NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Um, we've been here in Connecticut for over 30 years, we provide support, education, and advocacy um, on behalf of individuals living with mental illness and alongside individuals living with mental illness. And one of the things that as an organization we um, don't do very well is do significant outreach in the African American community in order to share with that population, this population, um, the programs that we have, we have a lot of terrific programs for family members, for individuals who are living with mental health challenges, um, for educators. Um, and so I'm here today not only to tell you a little bit about NAMI and potentially answer some questions for you, but also to learn how best to reach um, individuals such as yourselves and your community. Because what we know is, is that people of color get services at a far less rate than individuals who are white. We know that. There are studies that prove that. Um, we also know that there's a real lot going on to try to make that, make a difference in those statistics. Um, the federal government has done a lot in terms of looking at health disparities, health inequities. Um, they've developed what are known as class standards, which are, um, uh, cultural and linguistic um, appropriateness standards, and they're really trying to push those out to um, the medical community in order to really have individuals be able to see culturally appropriate providers um, in all that that means linguistically appropriate, because we know that that's one of the main barriers that stops people of color from going in for care is finding individuals who can who can provide care, who um, understand where their point of view is, where they're coming from, what their communities are like. Um, so I think you need to, you know, take some comfort in the fact that there is a lot, there are a lot of people who are looking at these issues here in the state as well. Um, there are a lot of different parts of the state, um, in particular the Department of Public Health um, that is looking, they're looking at health inequities, they're looking at minority health in particular in some cases to really begin to break through some of the barriers that are out there. Um, in terms of NAMI, we, um, we provide a tremendous number of education programs, mostly really working with both individuals with mental illness and family members to better understand mental illness. It's really hard to sort of try to access care if you don't really even begin to understand what the basis of mental illness is, that it's biologically based, that it's a medical condition, that it's sort of just like any other chronic illness you may have. I have high blood pressure, um, some people have diabetes, some people have heart trouble, and some people have mental illness. And as Dr. Rule said earlier, it's critically important to know that people with mental illness recover. 
people with mental illness are your friends, your family members, your employers, your um, partner next to you in church. Um, they're people that are in all walks of life. And sometimes the image that we have of someone with mental illness who is struggling with mental illness um, is such that it makes us not want to go for help because we don't see ourselves in that way. But it's important to see yourself just the way that you are and you may have a mental health challenge. Um, in terms of some of the programs that we offer, we offer a program called Family to Family, which is for family members who um, have an individual who has mental illness in their life um, and is interested in finding out um, about the biological basis, about how best to um, work with that individual, about medications and those kinds of things. Um, it's an incredibly well-received program. It's a national program. It's been around for over 25 years. Um, and I really encourage anybody who is living with someone who has mental illness and wonders how best to um, support that individual to think about taking a course like Family to Family or taking any course that would give you more information about mental illness. Because I think the more information we have, the less stigmatizing it is. And I think when it comes to destigmatizing it, events such as today really move that forward because until we can talk about mental illness in a way that we talk about diabetes and cancer and cardiovascular disease, it will not be normalized and people will still be thought of as somehow different than you and I. Um, and in fact, people with mental illness are you and I. Um, as I said, they, they are people in your lives today that you may or may not know are living with a mental illness. So I think having a dialogue like you're having today, asking questions so that you can better understand what some of the issues are, all of that helps to destigmatize mental illness. And the other thing, another way that you can help destigmatize mental illness is also when you hear somebody sort of misspeaking about it, to correct them, um, you know, to use person first language, what's known as person first language, so that it's somebody who has bipolar disorder, not a bipolar. It's someone who has schizophrenia, not a schizophrenic. We don't say that somebody is their disease if we're talking about cancer or cardiovascular disease. We shouldn't say it when we talk about mental illness because it really depersonalizes the individual and makes the individual a diagnosis. Um, and that's not what we wanna do. That's not gonna reduce stigma. So you can in your own way every day um, make a difference in terms of reducing stigma by simply talking first person language, by correcting somebody if they say something that you know is incorrect um, about mental illness and starting to be a standard bearer for what is true about mental illness, both in your community and generally speaking, um, and finding out as much as you can about it. Um, we have some other programs that I'll just briefly touch on. We have a program called NAMI Basics, which is for family members who have children or adolescents. I know that we're talking um, somewhat about children so far this morning critically, critically important to know that what matters is early intervention. The sooner that some that an individual can be diagnosed um, or evaluated, the better their prognosis is. Um, typically, they'll be in treatment less. They may, have, they may take less medications if they take medications at all. Um, and one of the reasons for that is, is that the brain is still developing. The brain doesn't really finish developing until you're in your early 20s. So if you've got somebody who's in their teens or even earlier or even a young adult, there's still an opportunity to intercept the development of the brain such that that individual may be able to sort of, in a sense, grow out of the mental illness or at least be better able to handle it as they age. So that's really important. So we have NAMI Basics, which is a program for parents or caregivers. Excuse me, I'm going to cough. <coughs> parents or caregivers who have children or adolescents, talks a lot about how to navigate the school system, talks about, thank you, talks about how to navigate the children's mental health system here in the state, 
um, talks about a lot of different things in order for parents to feel that they're empowered and can advocate for their children. Because when it's a child who has mental health concerns in a school system, you become an advocate. You have to. Um, just like Dr. Rule has become an advocate or probably always advocated for his brother. Um, sometimes that's what's needed and particularly with children, children need advocates. Um, so we have a program, as I said, called NAMI Basics. We have a program where we go into the schools and work with teachers called Parents and Teachers as Allies. It's really meant to raise awareness among teachers that some of those kids that are deemed to be um, behavioral problems or last year their grades were good and this year they've fallen off a cliff, that those might be early warning signs of some kind of mental health concern and to give teachers some tools on how to talk with parents about that because that's a tricky conversation to have with parents or caregivers. Um, so those are just some of the programs that we have. I think I brought materials that list all of our other programs. Um, we also do have support groups across the state. We have several of them in the greater Hartford area, support groups for family members who have people living with mental illness, support groups for people who themselves are living with mental illness. Um, anybody who's out there and is struggling, I really encourage you to go to a support group, even if you're not one of those people that goes to support groups. Um, I never was. My husband had serious mental illness and I went to a support group and it made such a difference for me. Um, while he was still alive. So uh, you will find there like-minded people, people who have walked in your shoes and are walking in your shoes. And that can be incredibly comforting. And it can also help in terms of problem solving because there may be people that have been where you are and can make some suggestions on how they got through that and what might work for you. So um, I encourage you to go to our website, www.namict.org. Um, there's a ton of information out there for you, um, and I'm happy to take any questions that anybody may have. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, can you tell me anything about cost for any of the programs? All of the programs are free. All the programs. They're all free. Good. Yep. And there, and the other thing about them that's that is unique is they are all taught by or facilitated by people who have what's known as lived experience. So the support groups, uh, the family support groups, for instance, we train the facilitators. Um, they go through a three-day training and they're family members. So they understand when they're talking with other family members, the kinds of things that they're probably dealing with. Our education courses are taught by also family members or individuals themselves who are living with mental illness. So it's really a peer experience, whether it's a family member or someone with mental illness. So you're not sort of in the, in the presence of what very often can happen, which is a clinical setting, which is nothing wrong with that, but it's extremely powerful to be talking with someone who has lived experience um, and to know that about that individual. Yes, Marcia. Um, I know Kate very well, and, and we work very closely with Kate, so thank you for all you shared. Um, I just want to make a comment about stigma, and, and uh, the Commissioner of Mental Health and Addiction mm -hmm. Services has really um, been pushing this point, and it's kind of like, you know, um, Dr. Williams, when you talked about trauma and how we've sort of been mistaken about um, the impact of trauma, I, I think that when we use the word stigma, we, we, we minimize um, the impact that we have on people by, by what is really discrimination. So when I treat someone as different and not okay because of their mental illness and, 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 and deny them rights that another person would have, that's discrimination. If I feel that and I self-impose that, and I and I, I I accept that mark of shame, that stigma, and I think we need to switch the conversation. And I promise the commissioner that I will <laughs> support her her legacy in terms of really calling it what it is and dealing with it in the way that it affects people. So that's um, great. That's great. And you know, and where that plays out, where that discrimination plays out, is all over the place whether it be employment, individuals who have mental health concerns are the least employed disability group. 
Um, it's extraordinarily hard for them if, it, if they tell their potential employers that they have a mental illness for them to get employed. Sometimes housing is an issue um, because people have various pictures in their mind of what happens if you live next door to someone who has mental illness. Um, uh, so the discrimination is real, it's felt. Um, and I want to thank Marsha. Marsha, who is a regional, uh, an executive director of one of the regional mental health boards here in the state who do fantastic work. Um, if you don't know, you should catch up with Marsha to find out what she does, but they do a lot of evaluations across the state of services um, in their particular areas um, to make sure, as um, was talked about earlier, that the programs that are out there are actually making a difference, that they're actually helping people. So the regional mental health boards have a critical role in that. Any other questions? Yes. I have a question, and I just want to clarify it because we have a large West Indian population in the state of Connecticut. And sometimes when you use the word just African American, you leave out a large pool of those West Indian folks who don't classify themselves as African Americans. Mm -hmm. How do you ensure that that pool of individuals, pools of individuals, are not left behind because of the labeling or the branding of the way the programs are presented? Thank you for the question. Um, I think that we're, you know, we're learning. Um, very often what I will do is talk about communities of color, people of color, which hopefully um, encompasses a much broader group of individuals. Um, and I think that that's probably the best way to talk about it um, so that you're not singling out a certain population, but rather are talking about a very large group of individuals. Um, and in fact, a lot of the work that has been done around health inequities um, when it comes to mental health has looked broadly at communities of color and not just Hispanic and not just, you know, um, African American, but more broadly communities of color. So um, I think that that's the best way to talk about it. And that's what I try to talk about. When you're laboring, it's predominant to African Americans. So that's the piece that I'm really trying to get to that. Even though you speak about um, communities of color, as you're laboring, still identify just more to Sure, absolutely. Yeah, that's a very good question. I think what has really happened is because a lot of the data and the research is based upon information coming from the, U the Census Bureau, and the way the information comes in is that any person who is classifies themselves as African American, maybe multiracial, or if they're African or from the Caribbean, gets actually um, logged into that category. So a lot of the statistics we, statistics we mentioned is because there's the way the, the numbers are put together. But we recognize that under there, there are certain di distinct ethnic groups that, that you really need to approach differently. But part of the issue is just the way the data is collected. Right. So that's really kind of unfortunate. That's kind of how it's done. But so when we speak, we have to be very mindful because, and I'll, I'll tell you, I am from Jamaica, but I consider myself African-American because I embrace that definition broadly as a person in the diaspora from Africa. Not everyone from the Caribbean thinks that way. Persons who were, who were born in Africa don't think of themselves as African-American. Some of them, I should say. But part of the issue is really just how the data is collected, unfortunately. But I think you're kind of raising a different issue that we need to be mindful about cultural competency. So just because someone presents as looking a certain way, doesn't mean that um, when you're engaging them as a provider, you do the same thing. It's not a cookie cutter. You gotta kind of figure out how to meet that person at where, where they are. Definitely. Go ahead. I don't want to belabor the point, but I have the same similar situation where I was trying to get community event together. And if I approached people and said, this is for black history, Mm -hmm. I, the West Indian um, population had, had no interest, right? Exactly. So I reached out to our group and I said, we need to collectively get a better term for our collective people and we have to collectively work together yeah. because there's, there's a disconnect. Yeah. So maybe our future state is working on that terminology, mm -hmm. but our current state is understanding that as a Caribbean individual, you know, census hasn't identified that, we're not there yet, but it's all for us. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we're all together in this, and right now we're not gonna we're not gonna change the world's thoughts about terminology. It's just not gonna happen. So until we're there, we need to just understand it and accept that that's how they lump it 
And it is it is for you as well, right? It's not just singled right. out for right. me or me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. not pretty. Yeah. No, and the other thing that I would say about that is is that we need to hear from you. We need to learn from you. And so the more that you know we hear what those cultural distinctions are, how people want to be referred to, those kinds of things. You know, because for us, we're, as I said, when I started, you know, not, and not just NAMI, but generally, you know, the provider community is continuing to learn how best to be culturally sensitive. But unless we sort of get information, it's really hard for us to be able to do that. The other thing is I would really encourage people um, who understand these issues and these issues are important to them to really encourage uh, either yourself or others to go into mental health care. We need more culturally competent providers in the system so that it won't be, you know, such a, a, a struggle for us to learn how to better be culturally competent. We need culturally competent people in the system and we have very few of them, I might add, um, for whatever reason. Um, so uh, I encourage anybody out there who's thinking about a career to think about a career in mental health. Yes. I think that um, for sports, uh, not only that you can get people of color or to be on the boards there. Yeah. And I think that you need to do a little bit more outreach. Maybe go to the churches they have their own <laughs> counseling, so maybe they can go out there and talk to the ministers and engage people that way yes but um you know and just the word minority to me means less than so mm -hmm. that's a word that already you come into the air thinking i'm less than somebody else mm -hmm. you know so a lot of this terminology yeah. really needs to be changed absolutely absolutely and we're and, you know and people of color then that means that we're the majority is becoming but if absolutely. you say minorities then that's, that's like you say lumping it's just this person that one right. so that we're less than but right. we're more than right okay right thank you thank you and i just want to point out that dr rule and dr mercado are on our board so hopefully they'll be helping us um in this in this effort as well any other questions yeah i think this conversation Way beyond mental illness. <laughs> we're talking about cultural competency and we're talking about uh, uh, just people being people and respecting each other. So we've got we've got a whole other conversation about race and ethnicity and, and how people are treated and how people present to any of these healthcare organizations and how they are accepted. Absolutely. That's I mean, we've got a whole body of work that needs to be done <laughs> for a long time. Absolutely. Okay, great. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to be mindful of the time, and we'll ask Dr. Mercado Martinez to come forward. But I think the issues that you just raised is so um, important because the issue around um, physical and mental health for persons of color has to do with many things, right? Historically, uh, distrust of the healthcare system, fear, uh, not enough healthcare providers who look like ourselves. And so that's an entire symposium that we can do. There can be one specifically about the West Indian because I just came from Jamaica and I'm actually surprised when I go there. So many persons who, no one has mental illness, no one has been physically abused, no one has been sexually abused, there's no domestic violence, there are no homeless people, and I'm really just surprised because I just don't get it. So that's a different conversation to have. With that said, I love controversy, and that's like I want you guys to get involved. Dr. Martinez. I hope you can see me. I think I'm the shortest one. <laughs> yes, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here this morning among all of you and this wonderful uh, panel. And it's curious that we're all talking about cultural competency and um, how we providers actually uh, get to outreach and get our clientele and people, actually, I must say, us people um, help. And that's actually what I was going to talk about. Um, it's about how we as providers become more culturally competent and engaged. And for that, we need to start with ourselves. 
we need to start um, acknowledging our own biases, our own uh, uh, set of values and morals toward other culturals, cultures that are not our own. Um, in Hartford Behavioral Health, we have been around over uh, 30 years now and was funded by people from the community that actually saw that there was a need that was not being met. And so they gathered together and actually created um, Hartford Behavioral Health and we're still uh, both in the community at the North End and the South End trying to make a difference and outreaching out uh, to all of people so that we can actually help but not at the point necessarily to where you or where the individual has acknowledged that they have a problem but actually from the get-go from the beginning of time like um, uh, Reverend Williams was talking about since childhood and us as parents going to our uh, taking our child to the pediatrician having them do checklists and actually a, a patient checklist to uh, measure uh, any type of behaviors or conducts or things that uh, might not be functioning well in the development of the child or that they are so that we can actually continue to nurture those uh, points of resilience in schools where teachers might already be identifying children that might be different and immediately tell parents they need medication, which most of the kids that we get referred from school is because teachers don't want to continue to handle that particular child that presents differently. But we need to then empower them to say there's different learning styles, there's different cultures, there's different set of values, and this particular child might not necessarily have a mental health disorder, but it's just a little bit of more training and a little bit of more effort. Um, and before getting into how many of these children are in our public school system where they might be overcrowded um, and, and a lot of these services might not be easily attainable. But for us as providers, uh, we need to, uh, we are making ourselves more aware of having cultural respect cultural awareness, create a sense of cultural security and safety when our clients come to our offices. Because if there is no sense of cultural safety, then that client will not actually let us know who they are. We cannot assume, like it has been told here by other panelists, that a person of X or Y race or ethnicity is what we already know. We need to ask those questions. The person that comes to us is, their, is the expert in themselves. So we cannot just assume. So we're practicing um, cultural competency from the door, the beginning of a person walking in the door, all the way to when they're in a session with a particular client. Another important thing that um, is impacting now in the, in the state, which I was very happy and I, I think that I have celebrated this, this just came out very recently, is the fact that um, here in Connecticut, I had a little bit of a cultural shock. I come from Massachusetts, well, originally from Puerto Rico, then ended up in Indiana, then came to Massachusetts, now I'm here. <laughs> That's my trajectory. Uh, but in Massachusetts, uh, something that it was very exciting for me is that I, as a therapist, was able to go to the homes, was able to go to the community, was able to deliver services in the homes of the client. I was outreach. I was out there, not in a little comfy uh, comfort of my office. I was able to, and it was uh, uh, funded, I mean, uh, reimbursed by medical insurances, and that's still happening. And that is the modality. You have to go out there. We cannot just sit in our offices or in our sites and wait for everyone to come to us. And most recently, the Department of Public Health has uh, made it a little bit easier and now to um, agencies to actually have satellite uh, spaces or travel with their own licenses to different Places. So Harvard Behavioral Health has started a huge campaign, I have to say, uh, with our CEO, Ms. Robles, who's here with us today, in actually outreaching to some agencies, churches, um, areas of uh, need that are wanting us to place co-locate services within their space or within the community until finally, 
and hopefully we can do it from home base. There are home base services though for children here in Connecticut which are very exciting and which actually make a bigger difference and impact in families. Uh, we currently run an MDFT team, multidimensional family therapy team, where it's composed of case managers and therapists that can go into the home, service the clients, teach skills, um, and, and, and embrace, be part of that family. We're not considered anymore a therapist when we're in the homes. We're part of that family. We become uh, part of that particular nucleus, and they embrace us as such, and we can make a better, better difference now. One story that I can tell you from a particular a teen uh, who came through us through that particular program, the MDFT, um, overweight, um, problems with substances, uh, doing poorly in school, during the six month period that he was with us, not only were we able to impact the uh, knowledge and um, uh, knowledge and, and resources that were out there to empower the parents, but to empower the child. The child was able to lose 50 pounds, which was wonderful, was able to um, be better in school and actually enjoy going to school. And he actually wrote us, which is wonderful when the patients, what um, uh, Reverend Williams and, and Keith and Dr. Rule was talking to us, we need to hear about our clients. They're the ones who are gonna tell us if we're doing it right. Evidence-based, I'm all for that, don't get me wrong, but evidence-based for me means that whatever strategy I put out there, my client is telling me that it worked. And if it didn't, I could care less about the studies. I want to make something that works for that particular individual. <laughs> so um, that child actually did very well. And he, I, I brought the little uh, note because I, I know I wouldn't say it in his own words. He said, um, "I am able to be working. I'm able to work on my issues. Drug and alcohol free. Yay! I'm reading. I'm writing a lot. I am being pretty cool." Thank God. Prayer and good therapy works wonders. My, uh, I told someone the other day that HBH really helped me by being real and to face my junk. I thought that was cool. So <laughs> um, we get um, our MDFT team, and again, that particular type of program where you can go into the homes and actually make the difference into the schools and to work with extended family members and work with their um, church uh, uh, congregation is actually, I think, what could make a huge difference in the impact that we make on, on our clientele and on all of us. We also talked uh, about, uh, to give you an example about adults, and we we're talking about um, our uh, black um, community from the Caribbean. And this is very interesting. And I'm like, oh, bummer, they're taking all my, everything that I'm gonna say <laughs> is exactly what I brought. Um, so we have an adult who came to us a year ago, and she uh, indicated that she wanted a black therapist. We were, uh, we're, we're wonderful at, at hiring diversity. We were able to pair her up with a black therapist. And I use the word black because once they got together, they both found out that they were both from Jamaica. But they were not considering themselves as African American, but as Caribbean, uh, black Caribbeans. This woman had faced a few months before she came to us, family violence where her partner actually had murdered her two-year-old. And so she comes to us trying to find uh, comfort, trying to um, go through the process of grief and loss, but also having other goals for the future. Throughout the year that she was with us, she not only worked with her cope, uh, coping for uh, grief, learning skills to how to continue to mourn this loss, tremendous loss, irreplaceable, uh, a trauma that will never uh, be erased, right, and losing a child under those circumstances. But she enrolled at Capital Community College, and she is studying currently a career in early childhood development because she wants to make a difference uh, and continue to care for others and, and send the, mes and the message of hope. 
she actually was able to get a job in a, a fast food industry, which she actually completely loves. And she was able to say, at this time, I'm okay and I want to travel on my own for a while. But knowing that when she needed to come back, we were going to be there and we will receive her back in, in another stage of our life. But we will also um, let her go at this time, which takes me to say that, yes, we cannot just say that mental health is incurable. As a provider, I don't believe that. I cannot believe that because if I believe that it is incurable and there is no way out, then what's the point? What is the point? So mental health is us, which Dr. Ruth said, one in five, and then one in four, and one in three, probably that three, one of those is me. And so <laughs> um, we need to, we call it for ourselves, it's very interesting. When we get together, we call it for ourselves self-care, right? Let's go skiing. Well, that's self-care. We don't say, I need it for my mental health. Let's go to the spa and get a massage. That's self-care. Let me read a book. That's self-care. But for the clients that come through our doors, what do we say? Mental health. It comes to the point that we need to tell ourselves mental health, there's no health. There's no health without having good mental health for all of us, for all of us. So um, uh, looking at interventions, like I was mentioning, in-home services, deliver services from non-traditional places, churches, uh, synagogues, uh, anywhere that we can be received. Now with the integration and co-location, which is the, the movement that we're going to, that's exciting, integration of services, holistic care, that is what we need, but prevention from the get-go. We need to um, you know, start working with our own self. Uh, I love Michael Jackson and his song, you know, work with the man in the mirror. Yourself first. Look at yourself. Look at how are you reacting or acting in front of others or towards others. And then you can be more empathic and actually passionate and compassionate and put yourself in that person's place and see the world and believe that the world that they're telling you, it is their reality. It's not made up. We all have a different point of view from our experiences and our childhood of how the world is or should be. And it is real for each and every one of us. So we have to start with us, this group. It's wonderful. I'm so proud to be here. And that this is a beginning of a conversation that should continue. So I thank you. Uh, I have a question about private versus public therapy. I've had both. I'm right now a really good private therapist. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the first people I dealt with uh, was in, in public at UConn, and he said something to me that changed and made me finally have hope. And this was about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. But he walked in the door and he said, how long does it, you think it's going to take you to get well? A few years. And he says, well, I don't think it's going to take that long, and I know you're going to get better, and this is about the time I think it's going to take you to get better. And I say that to say, he gave me hope, mm -hmm. because I walk into private offices, and I'm paying their, I'm paying their bills. Mm -hmm. So I got the feeling with a lot of them that I got to stay sick for you to keep living. Okay? And, okay. <laughs> first say to me, you're going to get better and I can help you get better. Mm -hmm. These are not the people who said, are you exercising? Because endorphins help your mental state. Mm -hmm. Okay, so why aren't we going to get people healthy physically? Because that, because I, if I'm if I'm working out, I don't have to take the low date, those antidepressants, right? Mm -hmm. But it, I probably still need them anyway. But the point is, we're, we're when are we going to get to a point in it where it's not about bread and butter, and I know healthcare is getting better and all that kind of thing, but we need to give people a sense of hope when they walk in the door. And I'm not saying that you all aren't, but there have been a lot of people I walked out of, I dealt with for years, and I said to myself, 
it was beneficial for them for me to remain sick. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a problem. It is. And I have to say, and I'm very proud to say that um, that is a transformational organizational change and uh, an individual change from pathology to actually seeing resilience from the get-go from you, the expert, who are seeking those services. I can tell you in our agency, from the first day that our client walks in the door, that's exactly what we do. We actually ask the client, what are you here to work with? How long would it take for you to actually, what are the goals? How can we measure when you are better? And we review that constantly. And we want the client to leave us. Believe it or not, we do want them to leave us. Sometimes it's the client, the one that doesn't want to leave us, but we say, you know, it's like our, the mother bird. You know, she brings up her cheeks, you know, she gives them food and then she puts them in the edge of the branch and say, okay, now go. And we want them to go and, and, and apply all those skills that we were, have been able to work with together. And then if there's a hiccup along the way, then you can always come back. And that's another, it's called more episodic sporadic treatment versus like in the old time psychoanalysis that you were there for the rest of your life. So you can have those type of um, treatment modalities that actually are more effective in my personal opinion and our clientele has actually indicated the same than just staying all along. Now we do have the other a spectrum of that which are real clients with chronic mental illness that do need to remain with us for a longer period of time and that's okay too but they still have achieved goals and they still have made recovery and it's up to us and i always um uh let my staff know it's up to us to consistently let our clients know this is where you were where you came in and look at where we are now do you notice this? Look how well you are doing now per what you're telling me. Let's celebrate this. Let's celebrate it. And maybe, you know, maybe it's time to go. And if they say, well, I want to stay a little bit longer or reduce the, the sessions that I come to, that's okay. But sometimes it's hard. It becomes familiar. It becomes a place where that there's no judgment. There shouldn't be any judgment in, in a therapeutic uh alliance and they want to continue in treatment but sometimes we do have to let go and and I do agree thank you for that any other questions yes uh, I wanted to mention something about the letter that you read from that, that young person mm -hmm. the fact that the first thing that caught my attention was he said work on my issues he didn't say the word problems mm -hmm. And that's, it, it might be just semantics, but the, you know, uh, someone had said before, the mental illness does not define the person. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's problem versus issue, problem, that's so negative. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, weakness versus struggle, mm -hmm. weakness is also negative. But I was really impressed that he said the word issues. Mm -hmm. And I've worked with clients before who have uh, been, been, you know, at alternate facilities, and they were they would say, "Well, aren't you going to tell me what to do?" Mm -hmm. No. And he, they would say, "You know, uh, they've been told, well, you should do this. Mm -hmm. You need to blank blank blank." And it's, I, I guess. I, I see what you're saying about the, the clients have such a capacity mm -hmm. to help themselves, but if they're told, well, you should, I had a client who, who said that the, the, the clinicians told him how to dress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that is where we as professionals need to, that was old school. You know, you need to come with solutions for your client. Well, no, we have to put our clients in the driver's seat. That's that's uh, another metaphor that our tell our our clientele, the people that come to our agencies, that you're you're the driver. You're going to create what we're going to do, and I'm just going to be there right next to you, and you're going to let me know when when you need me and when you don't, and what you need to 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 do. Listening skills. We don't listen. We hear. We hear a lot. 
but we don't listen. And I think that all of us, you know, together, we need to learn to listen. I don't know if you guys remember that little, um, in YouTube, that little child that was, um, Linda, 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 listen to me, Linda. Well, the reality is that Linda never listened to his frustration. His frustration was, Mom, you don't let me do absolutely anything in this house. The furniture is yours. The cookies are yours. The floor is your. For heaven's sakes, give me some freedom. I'm in my house. Linda didn't listen. And it's become very funny, but when you dissect it, and again, as a therapist, that's a horrible thing to have because I start looking at what the problem is or how could, what can I learn from it. Mom needs to learn to listen. He just wanted cookies for it. Just give him a cookie. <laughs> you know, it's like let him make a decision, but we don't listen. So to our, for our clients, we need to learn to listen, and we need to learn to then know when to, to speak. And I know this gentleman had a comment, question. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I just make an interjection and then a question at the end. Um, first of all, I want to say God bless you for saying that prayer and therapy works. Mm -hmm. It does. And there's a lot of Christians in this mm -hmm. that know that. And at the same time, I agree with the gentleman that sometimes it's just not just um, spirituality that can cure things. And it's really a combination of prayer and therapy. Um, with that being said, um, uh, I, I come here today to represent the community of Hartford. I grew up, um, the, you're in the middle of where I grew up, Charlotte Terrace that way, Albany Avenue that way. So I have a pretty good ear on the community, and I work with the young men down at the Kabbalah House in Albany Avenue. But a lot of people in this room probably don't even walk by it on a given day because it is a tough neighborhood. Uh, I work with George McDonald, who got his ear to the community, working with a lot of kids, and he does evaluations on the state as far as the program is concerned. So I get a, a first hand account of what they feel in the community. And also, I represent some kids that I'm working with in my program called Cooling, Controlling One's Own Life, which is basically a series of lectures on how to behave. And also, I have a program called Teaching History and Understanding God, Thug, which uh, teaches kids the uh, history and also it interjects spirituality. Um, now with that being said, and our kids suffering, suffering from secondhand um, uh, mental illness is what I call it, because they're one step away from reaching four mental illness. And what I discovered is that um, there's a strong need for cultural and spiritual programs. And the community is, is really asking for it. And actually we're out there doing it on our own. Um, we're not waiting for, for DCF, we're not waiting for the state, we're not waiting for the government. Um, and it's very frustrating um, because it seems like there's a disconnect, even though I sit in this room and I go to meetings and I meet people that's ministers and I meet many social workers who secretly agree with me that this their emphasis. I've done training academy programs that um, Ms. Lily can account for. I had great success, great response from the workers. I still got that documentation. So basically, um, since we see um, um, culture and spirituality work with Malcolm X, we see his transformation. Even though I'm a Christian, he's a Muslim, I still use it as an excellent example of somebody that had a transformation through this kind of educational process. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, Martin Luther King uh, solved a, a, a secondhand mental uh, illness problem for our whole nation um, through spirituality. So with that being said, and we put emphasis on rainbow programs, and we put emphasis on Islam and Muslim children, um, I just want to be the, uh, the, 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 the person that points out that the emperor may not have any clothes on when it comes to the fact that we need to put more emphasis on cultural and spiritual programs in, in, in this agency and in this community. And that's all I have to say. I'm representing my community, and, and that's it. I would love to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I think that you are absolutely correct. And I think that now with these new changes, like I, have, I was just delineating from the Department of Public Health, that um, at least our agencies now are able to get out there. You are going to see a lot of these agencies, not only us in Hartford Behavioral Health, but outreaching to these parts of groups, the groups, the wonderful work that you are doing and saying, hey, how can we collaborate? How can I bring you what you need to where you are versus having you come to us? Not only, 
Yes, we can talk, of course. Uh, I, I brought my cards. But um, how can we talk and how can we bring them to you? See, before we had all these um, other t uh, realm of, of um, and it, it's a catch-22, all these regulations that in order for me to move somewhere else, I had to uh, license the whole space. Well, now I can travel with my license and I don't need to go through that. It's a 45-day process. It's simpler. I, I can go there and offer it, not necessarily just for diagnose, but for prevention and, and co-lead groups together and make it holistic, spiritual, mental health, uh, nutrition, everything in, into one. And I think that that is going to make a great impact. I come again from a system where those were, were achieved. And sometimes we need to look to other states, not only us, and not reinvent a wheel and see what has worked somewhere else that might work here. For me, outreach, home base, being out there in the community, is what works, and I, I, I'm so excited because I'm gonna be the first one. I know my boss will, will might not let me go everywhere that I wanna go, but I'm gonna be out of my office. <laughs> it's like, uh, I need to be out there in the community, so let's talk. Any other questions? No, thank you. Have a good morning. Thank, thank you very much. I, we are at 10.45. What I'm gonna recommend is that we take a break. Hadid has not told his story. But if we, it looks like we need a break, maybe? Yeah? Oh, we can keep, okay, keep going? Okay, we'll keep going. We'll have Adid uh, tell us a story, and then we'll do a couple of questions and then take a break. Thank you. Oh, wow, it's great to see everyone here today. I want to thank uh, Dr. Rule for providing the, uh, through his book, the inspiration for this event. and. Uh, Miss Yvonne Davis, without whom I would not be here. Uh, I uh, like to say that, you know, you really, you know, rely on the community uh, for, you know, the things that you need to survive. As a triple minority, let's see, I'm black, gay, and bipolar. Okay, so I'm an affirmative action trifecta. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, so I, I, I should, I, I guess I should be dead. So why am I here? I, I was one of those kids where I really never understood uh, how other kids would think that their parents' problems were their fault. I've always had a very high um, self-esteem, self, whatever you want to call it, um, or you could call it, you know, narcissism or egotism. I don't know. Um, call it what you like. Um, but I, I was never that kid. Um, and I don't, I don't know if that was a function of, you know, my mental illness or not. Uh, I grew up watching my mother and father fight over everything from whether I should be Christian or Muslim to bills or whatever, and seeing her abused by him several times and in several ways. Uh, so when I got to college, I said, all right, I didn't really do much um, to really better myself uh, thus far. So, I, I, you know, I'm in college, I'm starting on, on a blank slate, and I'm going to uh, preemptively get help uh, before, I guess, I turn into that which I saw at home. And it became very clear to me uh, as I went along my, the first semester of my freshman year that there was a problem. Um, not only was my stress levels, were my stress levels escalating, uh, but my ability to relate to other people and um, my executive functioning, such as being able to understand words or uh, math, uh, all of these were being compromised. And so one day I woke up, it felt like I was like the world was going to end. So the I went to the campus psychiatrist whom I'd been seeing for, uh, well, since I got on campus, uh, I went and said, look, something's happening. I don't know what it is, but uh, please get me an ambulance. And over the next few months, um, I, I, I stayed overnight at Hartford Hospital that day. And then after that, I, I uh, was taken to the Institute of Living for a week and a half and misdiagnosed with schizophrenia. You know, that, that's, that's a problem. 
you know, the fact that people, uh, you know, young people who, you know, either come into the mental health system by way of police or by way of um, familial intervention where, um, you know, families actually have enough insight to, you know, take their children to, you know, a hospital or a mental health center, you know, there's, you know, misdiagnosis is a large factor in sort of, uh, I won't say failure because that's too strong a word and inaccurate, but the, it's, it's a shortcoming of the mental health industry, uh, you know, failing to uh, tell people what's accurately going on with them to get the right kind of medication. It took me until uh, spring of 2012 after transferring to you to a university um, whose caliber was far beyond the uh, I suppose the skill set I uh, developed at that time uh, in a I think what was a manic fit uh, I'm not sure uh, why I thought transferring to that university would be a good idea but I ended up having to leave anyway um, and that was because I just couldn't get the meds I needed. You know, no one would take my insurance, blah, 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 blah. So, uh, yeah, I, I came home to, uh, you know, I live in Montclair, New Jersey, and I came home and transferred to Montclair State University. And um, it was only at that time when, because um, my family is a big trigger for me, uh, being around them is very, very toxic. And you know, it was only after uh, sort of going into a tantrum and having to just, um, you know, say, okay, something's wrong and taking a cab to the local hospital that it was like after being in uh, outpatient and then partial inpatient saying, okay, you know, you were here before, you know, after you left Hartford for a little while, uh, we said that you were having a bipolar episode then, we think you have bipolar now. And of course I, I scoffed and I, I said, okay, you know, whatever. And the doctor who was supervising me at the time gave me a pamphlet on the illness. And she said, take it home and read it, see what you think. The next day I came back to treatment and said, yeah, this is me, let's treat. And it's, I think my success thus far, um, you know, having uh, done internships in Congress, being, uh, you know, post uh, treatment, now being uh, district leader uh, in on the Essex County Democratic Committee uh, in New Jersey, and also serving on the board of a local YMCA, uh, being able to push my ego aside, um, you know, uh, being able to, um, or identify things that that made and make me happy in life, such as you know political organ progressive political organizing to help younger people, um, you know working with uh, elected officials to uh, elected officials and nonprofits to encourage the passage of legislation that uh, will have a positive impact on not just lives of young people but of uh, I know someone just said that the, the term minorities was uh, degrading. Um, I'll say policies that impact communities of color. Uh, you know, that's my passion. And if I hadn't, uh, if I felt too less than, or like, you know, like my diagnosis defined me, uh, I don't know where I'd be. Uh, I think, you know, if, if you're, if you're questioning your mental health status, you probably need help, and that's not a bad thing. Um, you know, getting active in whatever makes you feel alive is your anchor to life, and you should do it. Um, I think, you know, even after the bipolar diagnosis, my members of my family would tell me things like, oh, and my mother would be like, oh, just get some exercise and all of that bipolar will go away. <laughs> Incredible. Uh, my younger brother, who's much less mature, um, calls me 
uh, a bitch for being uh, quote unquote soft, which means being honest with myself and taking medication and a faggot for being gay and, uh, you know, having the audacity to be so in front of them. Um, and I think that people who detract from your goals to, to become your best self through treatment or medication or whatever, uh, should be banished from your life. Uh, I think you should engage and embrace supporters. Uh, and I think that people who don't support you can simply go to hell uh, because I wouldn't want them, because I wouldn't want them anywhere else around me. Um, <laughs> um, no, I, I'm, I'm able to stand in front of you guys today and uh, be candid because, you know, uh, people say that, uh, you know, studies, well, studies show that uh, without, I guess, really, you know, like, really good economic position, uh, sort of in society, that your outcomes decline with every minority status that you uh, identify with. So I should be in jail or dead or some strange combination of the two. Um, but thankfully, by putting my ego aside, by engaging and embracing people who support me and love me and want the best for me, and either uh, you know physically or mentally just detaching myself from people who uh, don't really get it, uh, I'm able to uh, speak before you today in a J press suit and um, and be and be and be candid about that. And I'm grateful for every single bit of it. Uh, I don't know if it's God. I don't know if it's the universe or some otherworldly divine uh, beneficent presence, but whoever it or he or she is, I thank to high heaven. Thank you. Any questions, please, I invite, please, questions, anyone. I don't have a question, but I just want to say thank you for being so strong. <laughs> I mean, it, it has been, your journey has just been incredible to date, and there's much more goodness in your journey to come, so continue. I really to hope so, because most of the time I feel terrible. <laughs> but but I, I try, and, and honestly, uh, it's it's good to hear people like you who, uh, you know, are, are involved in this or you know organizations like this and others like it. It's good to hear you say that. I appreciate that. Yes, please. Just quickly, I just wanted to say it's taken me a long time to mm -hmm. realize that people who are not for your benefit and all that kind of stuff need to be moved out. So um, I'm very you impressed in, in, <laughs> inspired. Well, no, good for you for, you know, for being able to recognize that and for being here. Because, I mean, I've gone to therapy and, you know, my therapist will say things like, you know, most of the people that come in here, we just don't see people like that, like, you know, doing the things you're doing. And I'm like, well, what do I say about that? Uh, you know, I, I feel I sort I sort of feel survivor's guilt. You know, you're I, just bringing you're just bringing people along with you. That's all, and that's good. Well, I I hope I I hope that um, one of the things I've always sort of wanted to do uh, after sort of overcoming the the sort of cognitive dissonance uh, from being uh, previously being someone who did not identify quite haughtily did not identify with mental health uh mental illness and then afterwards someone who uh understands that i i need to be on medication and this that and the other thing to survive um it, it's i i've wanted to you know tell my story and, and speak on this for a really long time and um I just think that it's the job of everyone with mental illness who is able to find their voice 
and um, use their voice in a way that impacts the communities that they identify with uh, to help mentally ill people in those communities understand that they are not alone, they are not less than, and they, um, they can be their best selves. Yeah. The world has spoken into existence, and uh, I think you did an excellent job of speaking your world into our existence. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. I just wanted to make a comment. I just wanted to thank you for telling your story. I think that it's through these stories that we understand the impact of what we can do, but I also think that you give words to your experience, um, and that when when we just talk about mental illness, when we just talk about it being a disease, that's not the words that, but, that people know about their experience and it makes them afraid to seek help. Yeah, so when you tell the stories and you wor use words like junk, that's something that people can relate to and I think we need to do a whole lot more of listening and then telling stories that are real yeah. for people. So I really thank you for yeah. doing that. I mean, it's, it's, it's sad, I mean, I, I, uh, when I was uh, at the University of Hartford, um, a, a woman I'd come to know um, at an office uh, that I was interning at took me out um, for a haircut, which was nice of her. And um, it was in like the middle of Hartford, um, an African-American barbershop. And um, I, uh, that night at the barbershop, I was privy to a conversation about how Obama is a plot by the by white people to destroy the black community. It was crazy, and I, I, you know, she afterwards she took me into her car and she said, "I wanted you to see this because you know this kind of thing exists, and if you're going to the field into the field that you're going into, um, you know, you have to be cognizant of that, uh, especially in underdeveloped communities. It's it's like." going back in time, not in, in terms of just, you know, the development the status of the community, but of the sort of beliefs held by, by certain, uh, uh, by certain swaths of people in certain places, um, especially where the communities are less well off socioeconomically. Um, and I find that, you know, even my, my family has a really, like, has had problems with me taking pills. It's like, oh, you don't need those pills. You know, you're the person I remember when you're off them. And I'm like, yeah, the very dysfunctional, uh, pants on fire, um, self-destructive person that you knew that was depressed the entire time I was growing up. Yeah, you're right. And that's why I'm taking them. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Anyone else? Yeah, I've got this one here. Uh, you were thanking everybody else for your survival. Mm -hmm. Are you, you? I hope you're aware that it was you. Ultimately, it was you and your hard work. I did my best, and we're. Yeah. Uh, we evolved to be social, so you know, I I do what I can but I, I get by with the help of my friends. <laughs> Thank you so much, Philippe, for um, telling us your story. We are at a break, so you have about 15 minutes, I believe, for a break. Bathrooms are through the red door. There are beverages, coffee, and water in the back. Thank you so much, panelists. Thank you.